from Learfield on the Mustang Sports Network. This is the Pony Express Show with head coach Rhett Lashley, presented by SMU Cox School of Business, your ally for life. Visit coxgrad.com to learn more. Now at Ozona Grill and Bar on Greenville Avenue, here is your host, Rich Phillips. Good evening. Welcome into another season of the Pony Express Show with Rhett Lashley. And, yes, I am Rich Phillips. Happy to be here once again at Ozona Grill and Bar. Another great crowd with us here tonight as we get the season started this week with the SMU Mustangs opening on the road Saturday night playing at Nevada. That will be a 7 o'clock kickoff. I will have it on 96.7 and 1310, the ticket, as well as on the SMU app, the television broadcast on the CBS Sports Network. We will have uh, Rhett Lashley up here in a few minutes, but first we've got a special guest joining us for our top segment tonight. Let's welcome in SMU wide receiver Jake Bailey. Thank you for having me. Very happy to be here. Thank you for coming. I was just asking you a moment ago, did you ever think you were going to play three years here when you transferred after three years at right, Rice? Right, right. It was never uh, a part of the plan initially, but like I told you a little bit ago, I'm really happy to be here. So happy it worked out that way. This one really counts as your COVID year because you did play back in right. the 2020 season and unfortunately got hurt here in 22, right. which that was your first year here, First right? year, First yeah. year, yeah. Yep. And so you got a red shirt there. Had to feel great to come back from that last year and bounce back with a big season. Absolutely. I think it was a, a real confidence boost for me personally, uh, being around a great group of guys and having the success that we did, able to stay healthy the whole year. I think all that combined just, uh, just really boosted the confidence for sure. You led the team last year, 42 catches, 528 receiving yards. And those aren't huge numbers for right. a team that almost passed for 4,000 yards. Right. Yet everybody came back that had eligibility. Right. I mean, six of you guys basically are back. Absolutely. Why is that? Why Sometimes receivers always want to be the guy. Yeah. What, what, what's the magic that's keeping you guys together? You know, we have a very unique situation. You kind of touched on it. Receivers sometimes can be, you know, prima donnas and, you know, want everything. <laughs> you but, said that uh, word, not me. <laughs> but, uh, but, no, our group is really special. Um, you know, we bonded so much because of, you know, the situation we have uh, in the receiver room rotating and all these guys getting the ball and, you know, so many different looks. But uh, it's really brought us together and uh, helped us gel uh, a lot. And I think uh, the team chemistry has really grown because of it. It's got to be a lot of competition amongst yourselves every single day not right. just games but out on the practice field every right. day too y'all are fighting for snaps absolutely we push each other every single day um, we're watching every single rep you know in film after practice uh critiquing each other you know helping each other out what can we do better um what i love is that uh how collaborative it is uh you know never combative never butting heads but always working together and pushing each other so it's great last season a special season here at smu 11 wins and a conference championship uh First time in 39 years since it was one that Same. was shared in 40 years, yes, an outright conference championship. What does that mean to you and your teammates to get that done? The world, you know, I think uh, that's everything. All the work we put in in the spring and the summer, every workout with Grizz and, you know, all the times we don't want to wake up early and, you know, want to snooze the alarm and, you know, everything. That, uh, that goes into everything. And uh, for us to be able to do that after so many years and, uh, you know, talk to some of the alumni who have reached out and, you know, expressed, you know, how proud of, uh, proud of us they are, um, that's everything to us. So we love it. You play that slot position along with Roderick Daniels Jr. You right. guys kind of rotate in there. Right. How different is the mentality at that position than it is for the guys that play out on the outside? Yeah, uh, I think uh, me and Junior have to be a little more savvy uh, than the guys on the outside. Uh, you know, me personally, I'm not, you know, as good of an athlete as some of these guys that are running around out here. Um, so I have to, you know, count on being more cerebral, uh, more savvy uh, in the slot and uh, be able to, you know, rely on that to make some plays, obviously paired with my athleticism. But I think that aspect of, you know, me and Junior's game really, uh, you know, kind of kind of helps us, you know, climb the ladder in that sense. So. Does it take a measure of nerve sometimes, especially going across the middle? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Anytime you're going across the middle, it's, you know, it could be scary, but you've got to do it for the QB. Because uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, most of those guys on the other side are bigger too, right? <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> they are. They are. Uh, there's a quarterback battle in camp this fall between uh, Preston Stone and Kevin Jennings. Yep. Uh, coach announced, uh, I think it was Tuesday after practice, that Preston had been uh, named the starter. First off, how similar and how different are the two guys to play with? Great question. Uh, I think they're both similar in that they can make, you know, some crazy throws. You know, when you're not expecting it, uh, when you're in tight coverage, they'll find a way to get it in there. Uh, and I, I absolutely love that about them. Um, difference, they both have, you know, their unique qualities. Um, they can both make plays, you know, out of the pocket. They can scramble. They can improvise. Uh, and they can also sit back there in the pocket and deliver. So both of them are, you know, ap uh, amazing quarterbacks. 
Uh, and it was really fun to see them compete and battle it out uh, this camp. Both of them did amazing, and uh, I'm excited to see how it goes this year. Of course, you got to play with both of them in big moments right. last year, including right. Kevin coming on uh, to win the conference, to help you guys win the conference championship right. and then into the bowl game. So you guys have to have confidence no matter who's back there, I would think. Exactly. I think uh, Preston did a great job leading us all year up until he got hurt, unfortunately. Uh, Kevin had to come into a tough situation in the championship game, like you said, and uh, he did his job, did what he, did what he needed to do, and uh, ultimately helped us get a win. Um, so, yeah, to see that, I think, you know, we're not scared to see – or we're not scared to find out who's going to be in the game. We just roll with whoever's going, uh, and that's a luxury for us for sure. You guys have been practicing uh, right at a month now almost, right. I think. Right. Uh, so much of it obviously was just figuring out who's starters, who, you know, position battles, mm -hmm. things like that, getting everybody in shape, mm -hmm. getting all your reps in. How much different has this week been with a game coming up Saturday at Nevada? Right. Um, still getting the work in, still doing everything we need to do. But, you know, some of that good on good stuff, you know, we're working in more of the scouts, getting different looks from them. Um, not Maybe not as physical as we were, you know, in the in the early parts of camp. But, you know, work is work and it needs to be done um, regardless of, you know, at any point in the season. So um, we're definitely getting it in. Of course, you're focused on Nevada this week. But we all know here in uh, about five weeks, the conference schedule opens right. at a new conference right. at that with uh, the move into the ACC and a big one to start, too, with Florida State right. in the first conference game. What do you even know about the ACC at this point? Uh, I know, you know, it's a bigger stage, bigger lights. Uh, you know, it'll be a lot of fun. Um, obviously, I know the teams we got on the schedule, but we'll get into that film, you know, sure. when, when the time comes. Um, for a game like Florida State, I know we're all super excited. Uh, team, fans, everyone involved at SMU. Um, we give them the respect they deserve, obviously, being, being a good team that they are. But we, you know, we have no fear going into that, going into that environment or them coming to us. We're excited to play them, um, excited to show our best and prove that we belong in this league. The day the move was announced, which was, I believe, September 1st last year, right, right. before first game of the season, I, I know even at practice that morning, there was a totally different vibe right. about everything because mm -hmm. obviously we all knew what was on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Do you guys still feel some of that energy as oh, you yeah. get ready for the season? Oh, yeah. The excitement is tangible. Um, you, you know, you can feel it. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're really excited to get into it. You guys having to fight that a little bit to make sure, you know, you stay focused on these four games you got before right, you Right, right, right. Taking it one game at a time is definitely important. Um, you know, a lot of times it's easy to get ahead of ourselves and, you know, get unfocused. But I think if we just lock in and do what we need to do, handle it one by one, we'll be okay. Well, Jake, look forward to seeing you play again this Saturday night and uh, every Saturday except what we got one Friday. Right, so right. Uh, let's hear it for Jake Bailey, our first guest here this season. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. This is the Pony Express Show with Rhett Lashley. Coach will be up here in just a moment. I want to remind you, just like always, you can ask questions of the head coach. You can submit those during the week. If you go to the SMB Mustangs Facebook page or go to smbmustangs.com, you can click on the Ask the Coach button. You can also submit it with our staff here in person at Ozona Grill and Bar. And we will talk to the head coach of the Mustangs up next here on the Pony Express Show with Rhett Lashley.
Welcome back here to the Pony Express Show with Rhett Lashley. I am Rich Phillips. We're here Wednesday nights, 7 o'clock at Ozona Grill and Bar and also on the SMU Mustangs Facebook page. And just a reminder, if you miss the show live one Wednesday night, it does stay on the SMU Mustangs Facebook page, so you can still check it out before the end of the week when we have the next game coming up. And let's welcome in the head coach of the Mustangs, Rhett Lashley. How are you? Good. Uh, great to have Jake Bailey up here. I mean, I wish I could sit up here and say I'm not as athletic as other people and be that <laughs> athletic, you know. Um, you know, what Jake – If I think you remember a couple of years ago, you're right, none of us thought he would still be here. But, no. you know, right before he got hurt in year one, the, the game he had against TCU was just incredible. Um, was a team captain a year ago. He's one of our big leaders this year. And, um, you know, we're really excited he's back. Sixth year for him too. Yeah. Well, some people just can't get enough. Uh, I've said there's one or two guys I saw on the uh, Nevada depth chart today. They're seven year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a guy in Miami. It's nine, nine. years. So I mean, <laughs> uh, I don't know how that works. And I, I would say he should go get a job, but he kind of does have a job, right? <laughs> now he does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Well, you're coming off a conference championship last year, but you're not back to defend it. Seem weird. Uh, I mean, a little bit, but we're defending champs, and uh, t- you know we. It's kind of weird, you know, we get the opportunity to do that, and then we know we're going to the ACC, so everything has been just so fast since January that we've never really sat around and enjoyed it. Um, but that's okay. And, uh, you know, made sure our guys knew from the first day of fall camp, we're defending champs, we're going to act like it. And we're not defending the same conference, and that's fine, but we're still defending champs. There's only about ten schools in the country that are starting the season this year as defending champs, and, and we're one of them. It is in the past, but Jake talked about it too, and you said you just addressed it. It obviously still has meaning. You got so many guys back from yep. that team last year. It obviously still has a lot of meaning to your guys. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not going to help us get one yard or win a game this year, but, you know, you got to accomplish confidence. We did that last year. Our guys, um, a lot of the guys that are back learned how to win. They know what it takes to win. They know how hard it is to win. I think that's the biggest thing. They they appreciate how hard winning a football game is, and they'll respect that, and um, it's been, uh, you know, the first two years were great, but it's been a little more of a mature setting, more of a business-like fall camp for us um, in some ways because we got just a lot of guys who played a lot of football and, and in a lot of places played a lot of football together. And so I think, um, you know, from that standpoint, um, we'll be able to lean on our experiences from the past that will help us this year. As I mentioned with Jake, you had a quarterback battle this fall. You announced Preston Stone as your starter after battling with Kevin Jennings. Did some of that battle come from the fact that Preston didn't have a full spring, Kevin did have a full spring as QB1? Did that lead to it some? No, I mean, really, we had a battle at every position. That's why we never made a big deal about a quarterback battle because that's just how we run our program. You're always competing, and we're doing the same as coaches. I mean, 11 wins last year is great. We have zero this year. Mm -hmm. And so – um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Elijah Roberts or you're Justin Osborne competing now at center or you're Preston and Kevin. Um, we believe in that everywhere. And uh, you're always trying to improve and, and earn your opportunities. And, and that's the way it makes everybody around us better. Now, yes, it's unique because it's quarterback, and that's what everybody talks about. And you got a guy in Preston who was just incredible. I think his last five or six games last year, he had a 17-to-1 touchdown interception ratio. Yep. He was playing at a really good clip. He's 11-2 and two in his career as a starter. Uh, you heard Jake talk about him, but then you have what Kevin stepped into and how he performed uh, those last two games I thought was really well, and he got all of spring reps. And so it's, it's a unique situation, probably one I've never been in before where, you know, usually if you say we have a quarterback battle, it means something totally different. That's right. why we didn't really go there. <laughs> we, we have a quarterback luxury. We have two guys we know that can lead our team we can win with. Um, we needed them both last year. Don't know, but I have a feeling we're going to need them both this year. You know, and, and so we let it ha- play out, and, and they both did great. Preston earned the opportunity to be the starter uh, f- through the fall camp. Kevin earned the opportunity to play, and, and that's how we're going to do it. Do you have a plan? Uh, are you for sure playing both guys Saturday night? Oh, yeah. You yeah. have a certain plan set? We'll let Nevada or? figure that out when everybody else does. All right. But, yes, we do have a plan. Uh, the one thing I will say is you got a third guy that looks pretty good, too. Keldrick Luster – might have the best arm of the three guys. I mean, he can wing it. We Keldrick had a, you know, he was a true freshman last fall, so he's figuring it out. And then this spring, we saw him make a big jump. And then for, for him to back that up this fall, and people don't understand, like Kevin and 
Preston are going with the ones most of the time or the ones and the guys that are in twos that rotate. When Keldrick gets reps, he's going with the twos and threes and a lot of the younger guys. And a lot of times those guys don't have quite as much time to throw the ball and they're, you know, not throwing to – to Romello or Jordan or Jake as much, and, man, he was solid. He was steady. Uh, he took care of the football. He got out of his hands. He moved the team. He had it with a, a poise and a confidence that has given us confidence. And we got three guys that if we need to put them in the game will give us a chance to win. And the cool thing about it is, too, in this climate, they're all three out of high school. They're all, free from, all three from Dallas, mm-hmm. North, Central, and South. Kevin Jennings is from South Oak Cliff, right. won a state championship. Preston Stone from right here in the Park Cities at Parrish won multiple state championships, and Keldrick up at McKinney. McKinney. Yep. That's pretty cool. That's how we want our program to be viewed. Very nice. Also, I thought it was something pretty telling, too, about the top two guys. Your team, Their teammates voted both of them among the six captains on this team. They, they did. and I mean, I think that says a lot. And, again, a lot of times you look at that differently. I think it just says they, they totally believe in Preston and they totally believe in Kevin. And um, that's just hopefully the culture we're continuing to, to move forward with. And the other captains, by the way, I don't think we're any surprises, at least not to me, with Justin Osborne, Jonathan McGill, Elijah Roberts, and Kobe Wilson. That pretty much uh, – those are leaders that I think we all knew before the season. All those guys deserve it. What's weird is we have, we have a lot of seniors. Last year we didn't have many. We have 26, 27, something like that, seniors. I, I get confused on who's a senior with another year and a Trust senior me. without another year. But <laughs> – um, I mean, you got guys like Jake Bailey who was a captain last year. He, he's, he may not officially be one this year, but he's a team leader. Mm-hmm. You know, Roderick Daniels is that way. You go to the defensive side of the ball and, and what Isaiah Wachobia does and Ahmad Walker, and you just could go on and on and on about all the guys who um, I think our team would tell you they believe in every single one of them, and that's what's really cool. And so that's why we have six captains. That's the, the six guys who had that kind of vote. Uh, from their teammates, and that's a big deal, you know, for for guys to know what their teammates think about them. Of course, Preston had the broken fibula in the Navy game last year that kept him out of the conference championship of the bowl game, Uh, was cleared right at the end, I believe, of spring ball, but didn't really go full, I don't think, for you at all. I talked to him a week or two ago, and he told me that from spring ball to now, totally different feel for him on his leg. Will it, and I'm not saying that he's – from the injury or anything, but will the injury, and it was scrambling around, will it cause him to do anything differently this I, year, or can that cause him to do anything? I don't can think so. Maybe he won't go backwards <laughs> and he'll go that way, but I, I, can't, I can't think so. He looks healthy to me. Um, you could tell the first two or three practices of fall camp there was a little rust because, I mean, he hadn't played football since, you know, end of November last year. Um, but, man, I just thought he got better and better each, each day of camp, and, and he looks like he's always looked to me at this point. Uh, other skill spots, you got a lot of guys back from last year, including wide receiver. All six are back. And uh, last season you had seven guys catch a ball in every game, led FBS with eight guys at 300 or more yards receiving. I said that with mm-hmm. Jake earlier. That's an odd formula at wide receiver to make it work and make everybody seem happy because they all came back. I was going to say it is. It, it's unusual. Last year was unlike any year I've ever had as a coach. One, to have that much receiving talent on your team. You know, all those guys deserve to play. But then the way that the ball was just spread around amongst them and our tight ends and and running backs. And then to your point, in this day and age, for them to all come back, I think says a lot about our team culture, a lot about our coaching staff. They believe they they love SMU. They want to be here. They want to be here this year to go into the Gary Weber end zone complex and go into the ACC and defend our championship and and all those kind of things. Again, don't know what we're defending, but we're defending something. (laughs) And um, I just – It's different, and Jake said it, and every one of those guys wants to catch 100 balls and lead the country. Don't get me wrong, and and we hope every one of them does. That would be a really cool record. That would be awesome. That would be a real We'll need all three quarterbacks to throw it that much. (laughs) But, um, man, just the humility, the unselfishness, the the put the team first, that was what was so special about last year's team, and hopefully this year's team can capture that same quality. Do you anticipate it being the same way, or is there a guy or two you expect to be a breakout at wide receiver? I've given up trying to predict. 17 years in, I don't know. I mean, I think all guys are, are poised to have a good year. I think, again, when five of your top six guys are seniors, this is it for them. There's a different level of motivation. There's a different level level of urgency. Um, 
we know we had a lot of talent and, and we did a lot of good things last year. We also know we left a lot out on the field last year in some games. So hopefully we can uh, take the next step this year. At running back, unfortunately, lost Kamar Wheaton early in camp to uh, a knee injury. He had surgery on it, I know, already, and is out for the season. But you do return Jalen Knighton and L.J. Johnson. That's a combined 1,300 yards and 11 touchdowns that those two had for you last season. Yeah, it was unfortunate. I think it was the second day of practice. We weren't even in pads yet, and Kamar just cut and, and hurt his knee um, and had to have it fixed in a way that he's four to six months. So it's not um, – he'll come back as good as new, but obviously we don't have him for this year. I hate that for him. I hate that for our team. Um, I do think it's great having LJ and Kamar or LJ and Jalen back. Um, those guys did a lot of good things for us last year. They're a little older, more mature. And then you add Brashard Smith to the mix, who were playing at running back. Those three guys uh, give us some good depth. And then, you know, I've been really impressed with the freshman, Derek McFall. Mm -hmm. uh, we got Zane Miner in there, who's been here for a long time. And um, those guys will hopefully carry the load for us. Yeah, tell us more about Brashard Smith. You recruited him at Miami, yeah. is that right? And he was more of a receiver there than a running back. He has not played running back since back in what they call his day at the parks. Down in South Florida, you play at the parks. It's basically where all the really good players go play when they're like in elementary school. Okay. And um, <laughs> there's a lot of really good players down there. And he was a running back then. And then he went to Palmetto High School where he predominantly played receiver and punt returner. And then his senior year, their quarterback got hurt, so he had to play quarterback. He played quarterback. And uh, we recruited him, got him to come to Miami as a slot receiver. And we only had him his freshman year. And he was a slot receiver, but it was kind of like having Jake Bailey and Roderick Daniels ahead of you. We had two older guys, so he wasn't going to play a lot. But he, we noticed how talented he was. So we were just trying to get him a few touches here or there. And he had a couple good moments as a freshman. And then he played slot the two years, uh, the last two years. Um, you know, the opportunity to come here, we didn't really need depth at receiver. We just knew he was a, a really talented player, and he wanted to come, and he's a really good kick returner. And he played just enough running back for us back then, but even last year, I mean, I think he took a, a run 70 for a touchdown against Clemson. In a limited amount of time, he, he reminds you of the Isaiah Pacheco kid at Kansas City a little bit. And we just said, man, let's, he can catch the ball. He, we're going to need depth. We didn't know someone like Kamar would get hurt, um, but we knew he'd help our football team. And, and so I think stylistically – those three guys will all work well together. When you and I were talking last week about uh, your personnel, I thought you seemed most excited about your tight end position there. Of course, R.J. Maryland yeah. back. Adam Moore <laughs> played some last year. And then I don't understand after watching practice for four weeks why Matthew Hibner caught two balls at Michigan. It doesn't make <laughs> he, sense to He's me. caught more than two balls here already. <laughs> Boy, he has. Um, you know, I, I am excited because I think we, did, we haven't had depth the first two years. You know, the first year – Ben Redding was a warrior for us till he got hurt. RJ was a, a true freshman who obviously when we threw him the ball made a lot of plays, but there's just a lot that goes with that. And then Ben went down, and, and then you go to last year. I mean, obviously RJ was fantastic. Uh, Stone Eby moved into that fullback role. Um, but then having a guy like Adam Moore as a true freshman did some nice things, but we just didn't have the experience and depth that we now have. And RJ's body, I mean, he, he's, he runs like a wide receiver. He mm -hmm. plays wide – I mean, he plays wide receiver – 70% of the time he plays tight end 30% of the time, which means he never stops playing and your body can just break down. And so I think having a guy like Matthew Hibner who can do it all but still be a playmaker, Adam Moore being a year older, Stone Eby I think being a year older and still that physical presence, I just feel like we got a, a, a deeper room. We can put two tight ends on the field more together and we can also hopefully, you know, RJ doesn't have to play 70 plus plays a game and right. break down late in the year. Uh, the offensive line, a little bit of work in progress right now right now because of a few injuries, uh, no major ones at least up there. And center, right guard, right tackle, all different from your usual last year, but still a steady guy in Justin Osborne. You're moving into center. Yep. Uh, your right guard is going to be Ja'Kai Clark now. And then at right tackle, I know you want Andrew Shambly there, but he's a guy who's a little dinged right now. So you'll go with Nate Anderson, one of your uh, transfers there. Tell us about uh, some of the guys there in those spots. Yeah, we feel like we have good depth and good athleticism on the O-line this year. Um, you know, we do have a lot of guys back. You know, Logan Parr is now back healthy. Ben Sparks is, is back healthy as well. Um, you know, we started off fall camp with, with Chambly and Savion Bird at right tackle. I think both those guys can do that. Uh, Chambly had a minor knee injury and missed most of camp. We should have him back here in a week or two. Um, Savion did some nice things at right tackle, but then we put him at guard where he's also played, and, and so he can do both. And so there's a lot of versatility with him. Um, Nate Anderson started inside but, but played tackle in high school. And so we're kind of mixing and matching, and you do that sometimes as an O-line coach. Garen's the best at doing it. And as a head coach or a play caller, it sometimes makes you uneasy 
because you want to know where everybody is and get the continuity. But uh, now being with Garen as long as I have, I, I totally trust what he's going to do up there. And I just think it's, you're always trying to get your best five guys on the field. But like we saw last year, we're going to need six to eight guys that can play as a starter level. And last year we had six guys that were all conference in some level. That's kind of hard to do when you only play with five. And right. so, um, you know, it'll work itself out. I think the steady pieces has been Justin Osborne and his leadership, whether he's playing center guard or tackle, obviously playing a lot more center now, and P.J. Williams at left tackle. I think those two guys have been really, really steady. Ja'Kai Clark is, is back almost like he was when we had him at Miami. Dude played over 40 games and then Logan Parr back. So we still have a lot of experience. Yeah, you mentioned Savion Bird going to be real important. And uh, let's not forget Ben Sparks. He yep. had a, a ton of games. I think he started eight or nine games for you last season. Ben had a great year last yeah. year. And, you know, right about when J.O. went down against Oklahoma, jumped right in there. Ben brings a physicality to our offense, a toughness. And, um, man, he's done a lot of good things in his time here. All right, we'll talk some defense here in a moment. This is the Pony Express Show with Rhett Lashley. I'm Rich Phillips. We're here Wednesday nights, 7 o'clock at Ozona Grill and Bar. College football is back. And simplify your tailgate planning and upgrade your game day at the biggest SMU games this season. Full-service tailgates are selling fast. Contact Revel XP at 214-935-1683 or at revelxp.com for more information. Of course, the first home game that you'll be tailgating at is next Saturday evening. SMU hosting Houston Christian at next uh, Saturday at 7 o'clock at Ford Stadium. This Saturday, a 7 o'clock kick for SMU at Nevada. It's on 96.7 and 1310, the ticket, as well as the SMU app for the radio broadcast. CBS Sports Network is the television side. As good as your offense was last year, the old adage always has been defense wins championships. I really thought that was totally accentuated that one night in uh, New Orleans last year because the way the game started off with a strip sack that was basically a touchdown, offense drives down, stalls out, missed a field goal, and I thought, oh, boy. You have a way this, of driving home the positives. This, this, yeah. Well, uh, hang on, I'm getting there. But I was really concerned because, you know, we're playing the defending champs in the league, but – you and I both great weren't feeling great at that no. point. Yeah. But then you put your defense on the field, and the, everything changed the moment those guys took the field. They forced a three and out, blocked a punt, had a couple sacks. and Sounds like we should have just punted on first down. <laughs> and the way they were playing, I would agree with that. I just remembered late last season you told me one night, I'm sold yeah. on defense. You, for an offensive coach, you turned the tide a little bit on what you think of defenses, didn't you? Well, I've always loved them. I just haven't been used to having great ones on my side. Right. And, um, you know, we, we again, we felt like that was the missing piece, and it is kind of cool that we win our championship and, and our defense is a top 12 defense in the country and top five in a lot of statistical categories. And um, it was cool. It was cool. You know, when I kind of knew, I think we played really well against East Carolina last year on the road defensively, yeah. not offensively. Yeah. And then I think we went to play like Temple the next week. And you just, you're used to like, okay, we haven't had all this kind of success before on defense, how they're going to handle it. And even as a coach, you're like, okay, we felt we were better than Temple, but, you know, let down is normal and we shut them out. Yep. And I knew after that, I'm like, okay, these guys are different. And then I think the next week we're playing Tulsa and they go down and we're winning like 21 to nothing maybe, I can't remember, and they kick a field goal. And they run off the field and I'm like, you know, telling them good job, holding them a field goal is a good thing in football and they're ticked. Elijah Roberts was ticked that they got three points. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, we got something a little different here now. And so then, the, the, I mean, again, if we don't give them seven points, uh, the one touchdown they got, was, there's three dudes in motion on the false start on fourth and one. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I guess that's not a penalty. So, you know, I, in my eyes, they didn't give up a point in that game. And the seven sacks and the turnovers, it got to the point where as soon as we got up nine, I'm like, if we don't turn it over again, game's over, and you just play to your defense and – um, to have that ability last year was really cool. Kind of like wide receiver, it was a total team effort on defense last year. You had one guy, Kobe Wilson, who ranked in the top 50 in tackles in the conference, yep. in tackles per game. Uh, he was 24th, by the way. Uh, Ahmad Walker was next with 55. Yeah, That is unusual, I think, too, to be that good defensively <clears throat> and not have the breakout guy. Yeah, I mean, in a day and age where it's all about the individual being highlighted and, and there's not always something wrong with that, it was a true team. And defense was uh, – it was obvious when all the – I think we had 20-plus guys have um, double-digit tackles or something like that and a bunch of guys with turnovers. and all, I mean, it just uh, 
you know, and what it, it did is the more guys you play, the more um, confidence everyone on your team has because everybody practices better. They're excited because they know they're going to play. It's not like you're playing 11 and 11 and everybody's just there unless somebody gets hurt. And I think that helped our, our team morale as we went through the season and um, hopefully it helped our development for this season. You did rank second in the nation with 47 sacks, which was second in school history. And you did have one guy who had a lot, Elijah Roberts. Yep. Only guy you got really in your – uh, at least your starting front that returned yeah. this year uh, with 10 sacks for him last year. Breakout year for him. What more can he do here in his next year? Man, he's he's been awesome. Um, you know, he came in here, and in his, you mentioned he's a captain earlier, but in his first year he just he just went to work and played, and he became a good teammate, and he was productive. He didn't talk a lot. He didn't try to be – he let Elijah Chapman and some of those other guys lead. And – um, but then, you know, coming into this spring, he's earned the right and the, and the trust and the confidence of his teammates. And he's been as steady of a leader as we've had on our team. Um, so I think he's excited for his final year to try to show, hey, going back into the ACC League he started in, mm -hmm. he can do the same thing against those opponents there that he did last year. We're confident that he can. Um, but to your point, like him and really Isaiah Smith basically is a starter. Those two guys are the, the only two guys really returning – that started, you know, and Corey Robertson a little bit on the inside. So, You do have a new combo in the middle there, Tank Booker, Jared Harrison Hunt. Uh, biggest thing, man, that's the size mm -hmm. difference that you have given yourself in the middle of your D-line. We went out and we got a Tank. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, Tank is, I mean, as good as Jordan Miller was for us last year, Tank is like 6'4", 350, mm -hmm. and he moves pretty well for 6'4", 350. And, um, and then Jared Harrison Hunt. Uh, if you just remember Elijah Chapman, who, by the way, I don't know if anybody saw the clip the other day. Boy. The bowl, I mean, he's wow. doing what we all seen him do. And Man. He also looks bigger on film in a Giants uniform. I don't understand I don't why. Know how. But um, <laughs> Jared Harrison Hunt is a stylistically like Elijah Chapman in terms of his athleticism, um, but he's 6'4". Right. So, um, now we'll see. I mean, it's some big, pretty big shoes to fill with each hat. Sure. Um, and then – Getting Jafari Harvey over there on the on the boundary end to go with Turbo Turbo's Isaiah Smith, uh, and then you know Cam Robertson played a lot last year. I think he's he's a starter quality player that's going to play a lot, and then we got some depth in there too inside. So we like our size and we're going to need it. One of the things too that I wanted to point out that in that transfer portal, I think your number was 20 you brought in this year, but you focused on both lines. 13 guys play on the offensive line or defensive line because yep. that's where I think. Isn't it the biggest step up you got to make here in the new conference? Yeah. yeah, there's two real reasons we did it. One, we did it the year before, and we won a championship. Okay. So let's try it again. <laughs> like, we went out and we had the best defensive line in the entire group of five, in my opinion, I think in a lot of people's opinions, and we, might, we had the best offensive line. And, and that really helped us win a championship. Quarterbacks and receivers and DBs are all fun to watch, but that's where you win. So – we wanted to, to continue to duplicate that blueprint. Like, that's who we want to be every year. But then, yeah, going in to the level we're going to, that's where the difference is. And it's not – I mean, I feel good about our starting O-line, our starting D-line. They're going to run out there against whoever we play and be able to compete. It's what's next. When you get some injuries like we've had on the O-line, you know, how good is that next guy that goes in? How big is that drop-off? Same thing on defense. When you see a defense, three, four, five plays in a drive, they roll their D-lineman out and four new guys come in. Who's coming in? Mm -hmm. We feel like – Right now, we have two starting platoons on the D-line, and so it doesn't matter which one starts the drive and which one comes in. You know, can we carry that through a 12-13 game schedule, and can we carry that through some injuries that are just going to happen in football? At linebacker, your top two tacklers are back, Kobe Wilson and Ahmad Walker. And I sure didn't think Alexander Kilgore looked like a freshman last year. He had a sack on about play four, if I yeah. remember right, in the first game. And uh, those guys were just so consistent, it seemed like. Not to correct season. you, I think it was play two. Was but it? Yes. Well, somebody um, had a sack on play four, too, and I couldn't remember. But it was Kilgore on was, play two. It was so, two? Okay. Yeah, but it's okay. Not to correct um, me, but you did. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I think having a mod in Kobe is a really – I think – it's more valuable than we realize. I mean, Ahmad's played in Coach Simon's defense for a long time. Yeah. And he's got as good instincts as any linebacker I've ever been with. Like, he's not the biggest. He's not the fastest. You'll, you'll get him out of position. You're like, if, as an offensive coach, as the play's unfolding, you're like, we got it. And the next thing you know, nobody can block him, and he's making the tackle for no gain or a negative play in space. He just is a football player, like we like to say. And he's smart, and he's a leader. And then Kobe, you know, with his leadership, being a captain and just coming in, he did the same thing as Elijah Roberts last year. He just became a part of the team, helped us win. And um, 
those guys have played a lot of football. And then Alex Kilgore was not a normal freshman last year. So to have those three guys rotating as your core in those two core spots, I think is a big, big positive for Coach Crum and our guys this year. At corner, you lost two really good ones last year, your two transfers you had in last yeah. year. I know one of those spots is going to be Brandon Crossley now moving yeah. from safety back out on the edge. Yeah. You know, B. Cross decided, like a lot of these guys, um, he, he wanted to come back and play this final COVID year, and we'd love having him back. I mean, again, another guy who was a captain last year. So, um, And he kind of went through the spring playing safety still. And, you know, we, we feel good about our talent at corner, but we got a lot of youth, whereas last year we had two fifth-year seniors. And so uh, this summer, Coach Hundley and Coach Simon said, let's move him to corner. I mean, he's, he, he played corner coming out of high school a lot. He's got athleticism. He's, what B. Cross has that all great corners have is he has no fear and a ton of confidence. Like, I think deep down he knows he's probably not always the best player on the field, <laughs> but he doesn't let anybody else know that he doesn't think he's the best player on the field. He, he sure doesn't sound like it out there, does he? <laughs> he's actually talked less at corner. It blows my mind. But he, he carries himself in a way that, like, on every play, he just goes all out, sells out, isn't scared to fail. And no matter what happens, the next play, it's like that play never happened. And that allows you to play corner because you're going to get beat. And so he's played with a level of confidence in that experience, and, and he earned a starting opportunity. It wasn't like we moved him there to see how it would go. We know he could play safety, and he earned a starting job. And so I think he's going to be the leader in that room. Uh, and then at safety, certainly got three great ones right there across the board, uh, C.J. Sanders, Isaiah Wachobia, and Jonathan McGill, who uh, are all very versatile. They can kind of interchange with each other, can't they? Ahmad Moses, I think we have four starters. Yeah. Um, I think Ahmad Moses had as good a fall camp as anybody. Um, and, you know, played really well the second half of the season in particular last year, just like Isaiah Wachobia did. And then you got the experience of, of Jonathan McGill, and then I think C.J. Sanders, I think he's the best nickel in college football. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, a couple of differences to the game this year. And the main one I wanted to, to talk to you about was the helmet communication. Finally, it's coming to college football. Uh, one per side, offense, defense, can have in-helmet communication. I'm I'm assuming, obviously, it's quarterback, right, on offense. I, I told my wife about that new rule. I uh -huh. was like, hey, I can talk into the quarterback's helmet this year. And she said, oh, pro, please, God, <laughs> save him. Somebody save him. I could not imagine anything worse than having you in my ear all the time. <laughs> She's not shaking her head no over there. So – um, I did like on the uh, the ACC special about SMU a couple weeks ago, you told the guys you had to remind yourself when it comes to games, so although they're going to turn it off, I do yeah. believe, right? But you can't just go like you did in practice. That's hey, a good throw there. Yeah, like in practice, <laughs> I just have a walkie and there's no rules. Like, you know, in the game, 15 seconds, they cut it off or when the play snap. Both sides, there's, a, there's one person hitting a button and it just is out till the play ends and then it's back up. But in practice, like balls in the air, I'm like, good throw. You know, or don't do that again, <laughs> or whatever. I'm like coaching. Yeah. Whereas in the game, one, I can't do that, shouldn't do that. I need to let them play. But um, it, it will be good. Um, it'll take some getting used to. Um, the good news is we had it in spring. We've had it in fall. So, you know, try to tell some jokes every now and then. I'm not a real good joke teller, so they're making me try to find some. But to lighten things up. But it's just – yeah, it's one thing for him to hear the play from me a little quicker than a signal or whatever. But I think where the, the value is – your quarterback's the coach on the field in real time. And a lot of times you go through a drive and maybe there's a timeout or maybe you can holler something at him, but it's not till after the drive he comes over and you can talk things through. And in real time, he can, he can have a better understanding of what you're thinking because, you know, as you're, you're rolling all of a sudden it's third and eight, you can say, hey, I'm thinking two downs here, something I couldn't do in the past. So now in the past I call a third and eight call. He thinks he's got to get all eight of it. Right. We'd like to. But I'm, he, doesn't, he doesn't know that, hey, fourth and four are better. We're going for this thing. Mm -hmm. But now he might, and it may help him play the play better and not maybe force something that he doesn't have to. Um, or, like, hey, just remi little reminders, hey, we're in field goal range, can't take a sack, that kind of stuff yeah. that is in game real time or we huddle up. I can tell, hey, tell the guys this, you know, um, stuff that you couldn't do. Uh, or even, hey, if he's got a bad play, like I said, maybe you can recenter him and not wait till the drive's over or, or those kind of deals. So I'm excited to see how that goes. Um, I think they're excited too. So if you see him giving thumbs up a lot, that must mean whatever I'm saying is good. And if you see him doing this a lot, it's probably not good. But Will that be all, no, no signaling? Will you do all the play calls that way? No, no we still got a signal because only one guy gets a headset. Okay. So we're still not going to huddle very much, if ever. And so – 
those other ten guys got to know what's going on. It's the same thing on defense. Like if, if your linebacker or safety has it, yes, the defensive coach can talk to him. But if the other team's no huddling, everyone else got to know the play somehow. Right. And um, so I don't – I don't know, like, people want to say, oh, it's going to solve the whole signal stealing thing. No, yeah, it's not. It's going, yeah. No different. Yeah, it's not. But, but it, I, do, I do think it's going to help the development of quarterbacks. I think it's going to help the, the play caller quarterback relationship. And the most important thing, these guys are wanting to go play in the NFL. We're doing what they're doing right. at that next level. Who wears it in de- on defense? Because the problem there is nobody's going to play every snap on defense. <laughs> no, it's, it's more of a challenge on defense. You know, I think – Predominantly, our linebackers are wearing it, and, you know, you can have only one guy with it on the field at a time, but you can have multiple, like, for example, Preston and Kevin can both have a headset ready to go, but mm-hmm. they can't be on the field together with them both active for that. Same thing on defense, and that's a little trickier, especially if you roll your backers and all that. Yeah. And so um, that part's a little challenging, um, but we're working through that like everybody else. And then another technology change, tablets are allowed on the sideline, up in the booth, only to show what's in the game. Yep. Uh, you can't be watching it in past games or game film. What does that do? How does that change things for you? That's the thing that's the biggest unknown, just because we haven't really done it, that I'm excited about. Um, again, you can make in-game adjustments quicker and better and see it. I mean, so many times you're, if you're on the field, you're asking people in the box, hey, did you see this? What was this? What was that? Or even if you're in the box, you've still got a lot to see. And, again, in the NFL, the quarterback can go sit down after every drive and he can look at it. The, the DBs can go sit down and see the formations they're getting and, and the splits and those things. And it lets you make quicker adjustments. And um, there's just been so many times after a game, you'll look at the film and go, oh, if we'd have just done that, like, yeah. hello. But now you can visually see it. And I think for someone like me who calls plays and is a head coach, it's not like I can go sit over there and talk to the quarterback like I used to as a coordinator. So I think when we're on defense, I can have that iPad and I can be kind of looking at the last series and getting maybe getting a better feel quicker. And our coaches can sit with our players and do the same in between drives. And a two-minute warning at the end of uh, each half, does that mean you might use your timeouts a little differently earlier in a half? Not as a to burn one. Yeah, I mean, you get four a half now, right, right in right. theory. So, um, And if you're behind, that's good. And if you're ahead, you don't like it. But, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's definitely – it definitely changes things, and I think it's one of those. I mean, you watch the left NFL in your career, you, you have an idea, but mm-hmm. to actually go now experience the changes, I think it'll be interesting. This is the Pony Express Show with Rhett Lashley, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock here at Ozona Grill and Bar, and we'll be back here next week as well. Right now we've got our Ask the Coach segment. It is brought to you by the SMU Cox School of Business MBA, specialized master's and graduate certificate programs at Super Saturday. On September 7th, Kevin Knox is back. Yes. Learn more about our top-rated programs, hear from current students, and tour the campus and our new facilities in the David B. Miller Business Quadrangle. Register at smu.edu slash cox slash super. Uh, First question here, um, what impact, if any, is the roster size expansion going into next year up to 105? Is that having on your recruiting strategy now? Before I answer that, I mean, Kevin and I have something in common. We're both getting a new home next week. Yeah. Right? Cox School of Business, the Weber End Zone facility, we're fired up about that and always thankful to have Cox sponsor this show because it just shows, I think, the great partnership we have on campus with our schools, particularly Cox. Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, it's going to have an effect. There's still so much unknown out there on the exact specifics of the rules. Of You know, we think we know what that number is going to be, but it's not done. It could change, and there's a lot of other rules that will affect that. Um, you know, if it ends up being 105, which I know has been speculated, that used to be the number, um, so the total roster number. So we'll see. It's, a, it's, a, it's just too hard. I mean, we're trying to play a season right now, and you may not know till December, January, February, March exactly what the new landscape looks like for the next season. And to your point, we're recruiting. So we've kind of recruited like we always have because the number's not going to go down. Yeah. So if you used to sign, you know, we're signing more high school kids right now because we're in the ACC and we get the quality of kids. But if you used to sign 20, 25 high school kids, well, you can still do that and, and still go get transfers later based on, you know, we're going to have a big senior class leave. And so we haven't overreacted to that yet because um, I just want to know exactly what the rules are and then hopefully we can put the best plan in place. But it's going to change a lot of things. I mean, a lot of things for our athletic department, for football and roster management. You know, a lot of the things we do is trending towards that NFL model, and, and that's another one of them.
currently I know it's 85 scholarships. Is there not a limit on total? The scholarship limits are going away. It's going to be roster limits. Uh -huh. So if they say the number is 105, you could have 85 scholarships, but you could also have 105, anywhere in between. Uh, and that's uh, up to every school. And, um, you know, and each sport's going to have different roster limits is the way it's being presented right now. Is there currently a roster limit? Not totally. It's kind of – there's a scholarship limit and then there's right. a roster limit and it's off oh, – it's – Title IX affects it. Your school affects There's a lot of other things that go into it. There used to be, and now it's it's still kind of out there, but it's not near as concrete. It's a little nebulous there, you're telling me. There you go. Uh, next question. What are the top three challenges to win? I presume he means the ACC championship. Top three. By the way, we've got to go back to, like, who wants to claim their question? We've got to get a little interaction going. That's you? Okay. Perfect. All right. By the way, Cleve over there had the first question there. Perfect. Okay. Great questions. Uh, the top three factors that would that we got the top challenges. three things challenges, challenges we got to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think the first we kind of hit on. It's just gonna. I mean, some of it is, and it's no different every year. We were able to stay relatively healthy last year. You know, are you able to stay healthy? Uh, it's particularly when you know you got twelve games, the last ten being all Power Four games. Um, how are we? You know. When you do have injuries, who is it to? How critical, you know? But I think the health in the trenches, but but also at a lot of a lot of other positions, I think are always important. I think the second thing is I think to win, you've got to win the run game, you know. And I like throwing the ball. Don't get me wrong, but you got to win the run game. And so we got to stop the run, and we got to run the ball when we want to do it better than the other people more often than not. Um, and so I think those are two probably of the biggest things that just right now stand out. Um, and then I think the third thing, you got to win on the road. And, you know, we're going to be in different road environments than we've been in. Now, we've been in one like Oklahoma last year, for example, but four or five of them, um, you got to be able to do that. And, uh, but, man, if you're a competitor, you love those venues and those, those atmospheres. Last one here is by someone named Rick H. who asked this question mm -mm. here. Why do you take the ball when SV wins the toss? Don't you know the analytics? I do know the analytics. I do know the analytics. And the analytics tell you that the team who scores a touchdown first wins like 77% of the time. Really? Yeah. So why is everybody deferring? Exactly. I've been saying it for years. When, when it, the yeah. only time it's bad is the two-lane game. Yeah? It's really bad. We, we won the toss there? Oh, I don't know, but we got the ball first. Okay. So. <laughs> I don't remember either. I mean, because – when I grew up, everybody took the ball. Everybody took the ball. Yeah, because everybody toss. knew what they were doing. And it was about 10 or 15 years ago, teams started deferring, and I thought, man, that's We've weird. overthought it. You know how we get bored with things and we try to overthink it and make it more complicated than it is? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, the data says whoever scores first wins more than loses. Okay. I don't want to give them a chance to do that any more than I have to. And if you really think about it, if you're playing a team and you're supposed to beat them, you want to seize the momentum early. You don't want to give them hope early. If you're playing a team and you're not supposed to beat them, you want to seize the momentum early and, and give your guys some hope. I, I'll just – I'll wait. And one more here. This is for me and ask the coach. I was just going to ask you, uh, the news came out uh, earlier this afternoon, big news at SMU, that uh, Dr. Turner, uh, university president for, what, 30 years now, this is going to be his last year, full-time yeah. year, as the university president, obviously – it's had a big impact on what you've done here in the last few years. I mean, he's had a really big impact, big, big impact on my life. He hired me. So, yep. Twice, um, right? Well, yeah, I mean, technically, yes. I mean, I guess the coach hired you the first yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, right? Rick technically hired me too. So, but, um, you know, it's uh, 30 years is incredible. Yeah. And what he's done for our university, uh, even though I've only been here for a short amount of that time, um, it's – I mean, I don't think you'll – I mean, you've hardly ever seen it. I don't know if you'll ever see something like that again in 30 years and all the many things that, that he's done to positively impact the SMU family and, and just, you know, most recently with helping us get into the ACC. Sure. And so, um, you know, on one hand, yeah. I mean, one hand, I'm super sad that this is one more year and that's it. But at the other hand, other, other hand I mean, it's just really cool to start to, to just – Think about how many ways that hopefully he gets honored over yeah. this year for all the – just the many years of service to this uh, university. I've been here a long time. He's the only president I've known too. So, there you go. Yeah. And you can look around not just that. A lot of athletic facilities during his time, a lot of other buildings. Uh, look over here with Kevin in the Cox mm -hmm. School of Business. So, yeah, it's had a huge yeah. impact on the university. So, uh, again, that just coming out earlier this afternoon that Dr. Turner will be stepping away as the president after 
the coming school year. All right, we're going to wrap this up with our Meet the Enemy segment. It's brought to you by Ozona Grill and Bar on Greenville Avenue with the best patio in town and happy hour from 4 to 7 every Sunday through Friday. Specials including free chips and salsa. Ozona Grill and Bar, find your comfort zone. Of course, the host of our show every week here on Wednesday nights. The Enemy this week, the Nevada Wolf Pack, 7 o'clock kick Saturday night on 96.7 and 1310 the ticket as well as CBS Sports Network. They got a new head coach uh, this year, Jeff Choate. Coming over after three years as the co-defensive coordinator at Texas. Had some great success at Montana State as a head coach. What do you know about him and what style of play do you expect from him? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Jeff's a good old-school, hard-nosed coach. He's going to have a really tough team, well-coached team. He spent a ton of time on the West Coast, which is obviously why he's a great fit at Nevada. Uh, he's been a head coach before. He's got a winning record in the FCS playoffs. He's, he's taken some teams deep. And then he's also spent, you know, like you said, four years here in the state of Texas at Texas. So, and he's been some other places, Florida and others. So, uh, maybe Washington. I mean, he's been on the big stage. He's been a successful head coach. Um, you know, that's a proud program. Nevada's a proud program. I mean, the father of the pistol formation is from Nevada. Yeah. You know, Chris Alt. Yeah, like, that's right. Um, they they win a lot of football games there. And uh, it's a really neat stadium. And uh, but I just think I think he's a good fit for what they're trying to do as a program. And and he's going to have those guys ready to play. Yeah, they've had a couple of down years, I know. So he's got a lot of work to do there. He is going with a veteran quarterback, Brendan Lewis, <coughs> who was their starter last year. He's from just up the road here at Melissa yep. High School. Played a lot. He's got good size. He can run too. Brendan's a great athlete. I remember him when I was off to coordinator here when he's coming out at Melissa. Um, great athlete. I think he went to Colorado. Is now he's transferred. Um, Big, athletic, can run, big arm. Um, those are always guys that scare a defensive coach and staff, you know, and scares a head coach because you can be right and, and they still make it wrong. And so, um, you know, if you've coached long enough, you just know that many, many times you've seen a player like that just take over a game and help his team beat somebody when they weren't supposed to. And so we've got to contain him. I think I heard um, Coach Choate said he didn't throw an, enti- an interception the entire fall camp. Yeah. Um, so... Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we got uh, – he's got our full attention. Their leading rusher, Sean Dollars, returns, but they're basically starting over at the wide receiver position with a load of transfers. How can you scout and prep for those guys not having any game film, at least yeah. from that system to watch? First games are always challenging anyways. It's In this case, they know a lot more what they're going to get out of us yeah. with this being our third year and a lot of guys back. Um, but if they're watching, I mean, we're running triple option now. And we're running an odd stack on defense, too. <laughs> so we're trying to recreate ourselves. But, but real talk for them, like, they got a lot of transfers. And there's not a lot of film because he was at Texas the last few years. His, his D.C. and him have worked together before, but it's been a few years. Offensive coordinator came from Kansas, but he wasn't calling it. So, you know, you're trying to piece it together both schematically and from a personnel standpoint. But I can tell you, knowing the players they brought in, and they brought in a bunch like a lot of us have done when we take a job, they're going to be a completely different football team than they were last year. And, and so just like us, it doesn't matter what we did last year. It definitely doesn't matter. And they're motivated. They believe in the new system. They believe in the new staff. I mean, I think their defensive ends are from, like, you know, Wisconsin and, and maybe West Virginia. They got a safety from Texas. They got a corner from West Virginia. Like, they got a bunch of really good transfers, and they got a lot of depth at running back. You're working on your pronunciation to their guys? No. No? Nope. Pray for me, okay? Okay. At linebacker, they got Tonjiaki Mateolona, and they got more. <laughs> I mean, no disrespect. I just hope you don't have to call that name a lot. Their defensive end is Henry Ikahihifo. That's there my favorite go. one. I yeah. got that one going, so pray for me. There you go. They got someone off it, too. So let's, yeah, let's, I believe you. Let's stop some of those guys. All right. Well, game number one is coming up this Saturday evening, 7 o'clock, SMU at Nevada. Again, it's on 96.7 and 13.10, the ticket. Uh, also on the SMU app. We'll also have our special Pony Up pregame show two hours before kick right here on the SMU Mustangs Facebook page. So we'll be on at 5 o'clock for that uh, early pregame show, 6.30 then on the radio pregame show. CBS Sports Network is where it is television-wise. Uh, let's go do it. Let's come back here next Monday for another show. If we win the toss, should we take the ball? I know you're going to. Okay. So I have no doubt. Here's the deal. The beauty of being a coach, if what you decide works, you were right. If you didn't, <laughs> you were wrong. So Either way, we're going to have the ball first because I bet they defer. But at least it's different than marriage. It's 50-50. True. Like I got a chance. There you go. I'm always wrong, and I'm and I and I wear it. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm going to be in trouble for that one later. Uh, no, we're excited. It's going to be a great year, 
And, uh, you know, we're, we're excited to go on the road for our first game. But, man, we can't wait to be back in Ford Stadium next yep. week. Yep, that'll be next Saturday when we're at home against Houston Christian. Next Wednesday night, we'll be back here at Ozona Grill and Bar for another edition of the Pony Express Show. Thanks to everybody coming out here tonight, joining us on the SMU Mustangs Facebook page. And we'll see you back here next Wednesday for the Pony Express Show with Rhett Lashley. The Pony Express Show with head coach Rhett Lashley has been presented by SMU Cox School of Business, your ally for life, and hosted at Ozona Grill and Bar on Greenville Avenue. Find your comfort zone. The preceding has been a Learfield presentation on the Mustang Sports Network.